Hello, my name is Carl Monk. I'm going to introduce you to a new science, or perhaps an old science, depending upon one's viewpoint. It is the science of geomathematics, as taught to us by the Pyramid Matrix. The Pyramids, an unsolved mystery until now. The prevailing methodologies being used to explain them are inadequate. Our search for answers has been centered around the most simplistic of questions. Who built them? When? How? And why? The few answers we do have, we most generally thought up ourselves, with little regard for facts. But no real harm done, except that someone is going to have to rewrite a few thousand history books. The proper questions? Why are they exactly where they are, and designed the way they are? Ask these questions, and answers begin to flow. In order to read the pyramids, we must make an adjustment in our thinking. Once made, we achieve the fine-tuning necessary for the decoding process. That adjustment is our Greenwich Prime Meridian of 0, 360 degrees longitude. That's our Prime Meridian, not theirs. Theirs was very clearly indicated by the Great Pyramid, some 31 degrees, 8 minutes, and 0, 0, 0.8 seconds to the east of Greenwich. This, of course, means that when reckoning the longitudes of their global matrix array, we must correct them to Giza. As for latitudes, they use the very same equator that we use. This global array that I referred to involves far more than just pyramids. For example, there were great geometric forms, which were built up with nothing more than dirt such as the Great Octagon at Newark, Ohio. And great earth circles, such as the Fort, about a mile to the southeast of the Octagon. And Germany's Golo Circle near Bonn. And some circles were even built upward, in the shape of hemispheres, such as Mexico's Quiquilco Pyramid. That's what we call it anyway. The Aztecs call it Juliaco, and since they named it long before we did, that's the name I'll use for it. And, finally, the best known of all prehistoric circles, England's Stonehenge. What do such ancient monuments mean? These artifacts can be read almost as easily as one reads a newspaper, only the writing is different. We are a purely literary culture. We live, think, and work by alphabets. The geomathematics of this ancient pyramid matrix system was arranged around the language of mathematics. It has only been our reluctance to admit to ourselves that ancient men knew mathematics that has ensured the silence of their monuments for so very long. Deciding to admit it to myself one day, and following through with it, these monuments began to speak. British archaeologists have verified that before Stonehenge fell into ruins, it comprised an outer circle of sixty stones, thirty lintels held aloft by thirty supporting stones. The inner display, in the shape of a horseshoe, had five lintels held aloft by ten stones. Fifteen. Let's take these one at a time. What do the sixty stones of the perimeter have to say? They are arranged in a perfect 360-degree circle. Did the builders reckon circles to have 360 degrees of arc like we do? Remember what I said about admitting that Maybe they did. It's as easy as that. 
A 360-degree circle of 60 stones presents a simple mathematical equation. Sixty times three sixty is twenty one thousand six hundred. Now, why did they wish to convey such a number? Did they? Or is this just idle speculation? They did. Because neatly hidden behind this number of twenty one thousand six hundred are three other numbers fifty one, ten, and forty two point three five two nine four one. And when seen as 51 degrees, 10 minutes, and 42.35 seconds of latitude, we find that this is the dead center position of Stonehenge on our modern maps. Examine what is shown. Count the numbers shown and multiply. And Stonehenge, in absolute silence, explains to anyone precisely where it is. With this discovery now affirmed, we know that they used our present-day 360-degree system when working with circles. Another well-known system used today is the base 10 system. 10 cents is a dime, 10 dimes is a dollar, and so on. Did they also have a base 10 system? All we have to do is ask, but we must use their language to ask such questions, or we get no answers. Stonehenge has already shown us this number 21,600 in its actual latitude north of the equator, a single number which encodes 51 degrees, 10 minutes, 42.35 seconds. Let's call 21,600 its grid latitude. Now, if they wish to explain a base 10 system to us, all they'd have to have done is to build other circles at grid latitudes or longitudes of 2,160 or 216,000. The stonework at Stonehenge is what archaeologists call the Phase Three construction. It dates to 1,750 years before Christ. The first phase, dating a thousand years earlier, was a simple circular earthworks with a diameter of roughly 228 feet. It looks rather blank without the stones, doesn't it? Yet even this construction was important because the ancients built analogues to it everywhere. At least two of them right here in North America, at Newark, Ohio. Almost a carbon copy, isn't it? Except this one has a diameter of 1,056 feet, one-fifth of a mile. Its original name lost in time, we call it a fort, built by the Hopewell Indians. But that defies logic. Indians never built forts, they attacked them. Obtain a U.S. Geological Survey map for Newark, lay out a grid, and anyone can find that the fort centers itself at precisely 40 degrees, 0, 02 minutes, and 27.00 seconds north latitude. And these figures multiply to exactly 2,160, which is one-tenth of the 21,600 grid latitude of Stonehenge. That's a base 10 system using earthworks of comparable format. Of course, there are those who would be more than happy to write all of this off to mere coincidence. After all, history is comfortable with the idea that the early American Indians were ignorant because they didn't have an alphabet like ours. But they did have an alphabet. It was mathematical. And to ensure that we would have no difficulty understanding it on our side of time, they built a third opinion, and right here at Newark. Remember now, we must reckon their longitudes from Giza, not our modern Greenwich. While this circle on the octagon is centered at 82 degrees, 
26 minutes, 55.4 seconds west of Greenwich today. It was originally 113 degrees, 34 minutes, 56.22 seconds west of Giza's Great Pyramid. The individual numbers of which multiply to 216,000. The fort at grid latitude 2,160. Stonehenge at 21,600, and now the circle in the octagon at its grid longitude of 216,000. No question about it. They also knew our base 10 system, and they proved it to us through their geomathematics. But what about the octagon itself? What was its function in this incredible system of geomathematical order? Examine it closely. Notice that its eight sides are opened eight times. In other words, its eight sides are divided by eight. Okay, what are we supposed to divide by eight? The attached circle, of course. Divide its grid longitude of 216,000 by eight, which gets us 27,000 exactly. And guess what we have at grid latitude 27,000? Germany's Golo Circle. Neatly centered upon the Earth at exactly 50 degrees, 20 minutes, 27 seconds. Said numbers of which multiply to 27,000. And found from eight divisions in an octagon, one-third of a world away. Yet, what was the original mandate that required the Golo Circle to be placed at grid latitude 27,000? One quality of mathematics is its ability to run in circles, so there has to be another way, or ways, for this ancient global matrix to prove a basis for Golo. Where do we find that? Before it fell into ruins, when a visitor approached Stonehenge, what was the first number to come to mind? Yes, two. Two separate efforts here, lintels and supporting rocks. Then, once inside, the observer finds the 15 inner and 60 outer stones. Three base numbers here, 2, 15, and 60. And when multiplied, they become 1,800. Now then, Take this 1,800 and multiply it by the 15 inner stones to find 27,000, the grid latitude of Golo. The outer circle of stones at Stonehenge was complete, unbroken, but the inner display was divided into five separate units. Dividing 1,800 by 5, we return to the base, 360. When they tell us to do something like this, they had to have left us a monument which answers their matrix at 360. Did they leave us something at 360? Sure. Marking their prime meridian as it did, Giza's Great Pyramid centers itself on 360 degrees of longitude. But that's a pyramid, a squared monument, involving the pi ratio and a different aspect of this matrix. What we're looking for has to be round, like Stonehenge. Mexico's Juliaco is round. It says 360 degrees. And that is exactly where it is. 19 degrees, 18 minutes, and 01.5263 seconds north of the equator, the numbers of which all multiply to 360. Juliaco's grid latitude is 360. See, anyone can read this matrix. All we have to do is think, but in their language. We have only to admit to ourselves that they knew math at least as well as we do. Or we can simply throw the maps and the math away, leave things as they are, and remain in the dark. What we are seeing in this matrix 
is the signature of someone who raised global positioning to a fine art, not Stone Age degenerates. Why does Juliaco have four terraces on it? To explain how they did their spherical computations. You see, like Stonehenge, Juliaco is an equation. It shows us how to perform spherical calculations without using the pi ratio. But that's for another time. Thank you. I concluded the introduction by saying that Mexico's Juliaco Pyramid was actually an equation in spherical mathematics. And I this determination despite the fact that this monument is not yet fully excavated. It has a distinction shared by very few ancient pyramids. It reached us with its base intact. The lower 33 feet of the structure was encased in a lava flow from a nearby volcano a little over 2,000 years ago, at which time the pyramid was already very ancient. Accordingly, we do have an inside date for that which follows. Spherical math from before the time of Christ, and Western style at that. Why hasn't someone noticed this before? Because we look at these structures through our eyes, not theirs. They handled math differently than we do. They committed mathematical law to geodetics, a methodology we're not familiar with. Hence, when our experts drew their conclusions for Juliaco, it became a cult temple of some sort, and we wrote it into history as such. Problem solved, case closed. Now, don't misunderstand, please. There's nothing wrong with the way we do math. After all, it was good enough to take us to the moon and back. The math involved with that is virtually unreadable. In layman's terms, it would be like trying to hit a falling penny with a twenty-two rifle at a half-mile distance. Not easily done. Our modern game rules for math are very simple. It is based either on the constants of geodetic form, the 360-degree circle, 720-degree tetrahedron, 1080-degree pyramid, 2160-degree cube, and similar geometrics. Or the pi ratio. And, of course, ordinary numbers. These are our constants. But within these constants are a plethora of other constants. For example, if we multiply constant pi and constant 360, we get 1130.9733. We don't recognize the number, but it is another constant simply because it is the product of two other known constants. Constant to constant will always result in another constant. It's unavoidable. But 
not being used to recognizing constants which derive from the multiplying or dividing of two or more constants, when we look at something like Juliaco, all we see is four 360-degree circles. It fails to register. I mean, look at it. Can you see formulas here toward spherical computations? No, of course you can't. We do not reason our math as these people did, nor will we ever, unless we learn to think as they did, to see the law as they did. As good as we are with math, we are actually running in low gear. Math has a second gear, a third, and even overdrive, levels we have not yet achieved. But how does one look for these higher speeds when the best tools we have are those which hold us in low gear? It means starting over. Forget everything we know about math, except the constants, and go back to square one. Take the numbers and constants, mix them up, run them through the mill again, and look for new constants. Things we might have missed the first time around. Math is a rigid realm. Its laws are firm, at least to our way of thinking. But that doesn't mean that other deliveries are not possible. To us, the common circle exists to specific proportions. We see a circle. We've just got to measure it. We must have its radius, diameter, circumference, area, and so on. But suppose its measurements are not important. Suppose the language of the circle is the same from one to another, and irregardless of their measurements. These would be circles involving the so-called radian. In that consciousness, all circles have 360 degrees of arc. Their radians, obtained by dividing 360 by double pi, would always be exactly 57.2957 degrees. Degrees. And it would make absolutely no difference what the circle's proportions actually are, whether 10 feet wide, 100, or even 1,000. It's a 360-degree circle, and its radius, the radian, will always be 57.295 degrees. End of matter. If these ancient builders thought in such terms, then we will never answer Juliaco by measuring it. Measurements would be irrelevant. So what is Juliaco's communication to us? What did its builders know that we do not? How are we to see through their eyes? We have already substantiated at Stonehenge that they knew and used the very same 360-degree reasoning system that we do when dealing with circles. And they certainly knew our base 10 system. And they knew the pi ratio inside out, as I will show in a separate segment later on. And given the fact that the Great Pyramid, the tallest one ever built, shows it to us so abundantly, is it not possible, even likely, that their intent was that we simply apply the pi ratio to whatever we see in their matrix, no matter where it happens to be on Earth. It does present a possible decoding plan, doesn't it? Shall we test it on Juliaco? To our mind, a circle infers pi. And here on Juliaco we see four circles. Could that mean four pi? Let's divide the 360-degree form of Juliaco by 4 pi. Their logic lies exposed after 2,000-plus years of silence. What is it? Well, of course you don't recognize it. It's doubtful that very many professional mathematicians will recognize it because they're not used to working with it. But 28.64788 is exactly one-half 
of the 57.2957 radian. Okay, fine. But what are we to do with it? Give it back to 360. The answer is also a mathematical constant, even though we're not used to looking at it. It is, in fact, the area of any 360-degree circle. Using our time-honored formula for finding the area of a circle, r is the radian, we square it, we get this. Formula for the area of a circle is radius squared times pi equals area. See? Same product. But the two formulas were different, weren't they? In our logic, we square the radian and multiply by pi. But in their primitive logic... All they did was to multiply the 360-degree circle by one-half the radian. No pi in their formula at all. The area of the 360-degree circle, and without regard to its actual measurements. And that's not all it is. It is also the grid longitude of the Juliaco, 130 degrees, 19 minutes, and 04.1754 seconds to the west of Giza. Juliaco's basic message, then, is the generic circle. Grid latitude 360. Grid longitude, the area of the 360-degree circle. And grid vector, one-half of the radian. An equation. Have we solved the puzzle? No. What we have so far is just the introduction. We still have those four terraces to explain. Never leave until the work is finished. I said earlier that Juliaco is an equation in spherical math, but it's unlike anything we have ever seen. It's a whole new ball game. When we work with circles and spheres, we rely on three time-honored formulas. The first yields the area of a circle. In the 360-degree mode, that would become 10,313.24 square degrees. This one finds us the surface area of a sphere. For the 360 degree sphere, it finds 41,252.96 square degrees. And our formula for determining the volume of a sphere. For the 360-degree sphere, 787,873.52 cubic degrees. Three separate formulas. And just look how often we have to call upon the pi ratio like it's some kind of a crutch. Well, we all know what crutches are for, but to ancient thought they were things to be rid of. This is how they did it in pre-Hispanic times. And Juliaco explains the formula to us step by step. Four terraces, 360-degree circles, vector one-half the radian. Result is the surface area of the sphere, 41,252.96. Divide that by the four terraces, you get the area of the circle. Multiply it by one-third of the radian, you get the volume of the sphere. What tells us one-third of the radian at Juliaco? It's obvious. 
Look how the terraces are arranged. The upper terrace is set back well clear of the perimeter, a much smaller terrace. One small terrace over three large terraces. That's one over three, isn't it? One third. And since we already know that Huleaka was a radian based structure, the connection is obvious. One third of the radian. As I said, Huliaco is a formula in circular and spherical math, and in one fell swoop, it obsoletes all three of our time-honored formulas in that realm, a single, all-encompassing formula, and one which ignores our favorite crutch, the pi ratio. And history calls these people primitive? Never call primitive primitive without taking a good long look in a mirror, it just might backfire. Is this an entirely pre-Hispanic thing we see at Huleaco? No, it enjoyed a global application. Archaeologists don't pay a lot of attention to the smaller pyramids at Giza, but they too play in the matrix. As we see now, finally, at the southern base of the Micarinus are the three we call pyramids number seven, eight, and nine, resting silently on a parallel of latitude which answers the surface area of the 360-degree sphere. Radian-based mathematics, not pi. That's what this matrix was all about. Now, we begin to see it through their eyes. Uliaco taught us to apply the pi ratio to the numbers shown by the ancient architect. When we saw the four terraces and gave them the value of four pi, we were immediately equipped to decode its position in the matrix. Now let's take this primitive logic back to Stonehenge and apply it to what we see over there. British archaeologist A.T.C. Atkinson found the diameter of the Phase I outer circle at Stonehenge to be 288 feet. Following Juliaco's directions, that becomes 288 pi. The outer circle of Phase Three Stonehenge, with its 60 stones all arranged in a complete 360-degree circle, provided us with the 21,600 grid latitude of Stonehenge. Does it not follow, then, that its inner horseshoe-shaped arrangement should guide us toward its grid longitude? Sure, but we must be careful here. This inner arrangement is not rational. Don't misunderstand. The 15 is a rational number. But the way they have this horseshoe arranged 
is irrational. It is broken into separate displays, whereas the outer stone circle of sixty stones was unbroken, a complete circle. Why did they show us these fifteen inner stones irrationally? Are we supposed to somehow see fifteen as an irrational number? And if so, how are we to do this? Let's go back to square one for a moment. What does Stonehenge show? It shows sixty stones on its perimeter, a rational number and rational presentation, a complete circle. Its inner horseshoe shows us fifteen stones, a rational number, but at the same time an irrational presentation. Then we have the rational number two, an inner display and an outer display, two. Three rational numbers, two, fifteen, and sixty, but they don't fit, do they? Fifteen times two is not sixty, yet the fifteen stones of the horseshoe are inside the unbroken outer stone display. These numbers must somehow go together. How are we to make them speak logically? There's only one way. By reducing both its fifteen and its sixty to their own square roots, only in so doing can we build a functional link between all three numbers. Is this why the builders broke the fifteen inner stones into an irrational display, to show us that we must see it as a square root? Curiosity. We must exercise curiosity. So let's take our 288 pi off phase one. 15, and the square root of 15, and see what they say. Notice, please, that I am not simply pulling these numbers out of thin air, as so many numerologists like to do. I am following their directions. These numbers are either shown at the site or strongly suggested. Now, what is 52,562.89164? It's the figure which encodes the actual West Giza longitude of Stonehenge, 32 degrees, 57 minutes, 28.817 seconds. Which certainly seems to confirm that the square root of 15 is a valid, anciently intended, though hidden, constant in the math of Stonehenge. Then, too, this grid longitude for Stonehenge locks itself in on other mathematical constants. For example, this equation uses the 288-foot diameter of Phase I Stonehenge. We do know that the circumference of Stonehenge three is about 305 and three-quarter feet, but about is not adequate here. The only thing we can be sure of at this time is that it has a circumference of 360 degrees. After all, that's what Juliaco taught us about circles. So 360 becomes 360 pi. Divide our suspect grid longitude of Stonehenge by 360 pi, and we find the square root of another mathematical constant, 2160, the number of angular degrees in the geometric cube. The square root of 2160, then, is a lost constant now retrieved. We can park it in the back of our minds and refer to it as required. Next, giving the 360-degree circle of Stonehenge the value of 360 pi finds its grid longitude. Should the same logic not apply to its grid latitude? Sure, it has to. As we already know, the sixty stones and the 360-degree perimeter of Phase three Stonehenge furnished us its grid latitude. Now we shall take that 360-degree circle, redesignate it 360 pi, and give it back to 21,600. Remember it? It 
It's one-third of the 360-degree radian. The ratio between the volume and surface area of the 360-degree sphere, as explained by the Juliaco Pyramid back in the previous segment. Solid stuff. 360 pi from the grid latitude of Stonehenge shows us one-third of the radian. 360 pi from its grid longitude shows us the square root of 2160. Let's combine these results, just to see if any other lost constants turn up. Uh-huh, another one. And we are not completely unfamiliar with it, though this is the first time we have seen it in this mode. Another square root. The square root of the volume of the 360-degree sphere. They sure used a lot of constants we're not familiar with, didn't they? The radian, one-half and one-third of it. The square roots of 15, 60, 21, 60, and the volume of the 360-degree sphere. Is that all of them? I wish it was. But there are more. It was well over a century ago now that Englishman John Taylor advanced his theory that Egypt's Great Pyramid was a model of the mathematical constant double pi, 6.28318, and that when its base perimeter was multiplied by double pi, the answer in British feet came in fairly close to the pyramid's actual height. Unfortunately, several centuries before, the Arabs tore all the facing stones off the Great Pyramid, thereby erasing its original measurements. Without them, he could not prove his theory. Well, Mr. Taylor was right on the money, as I will demonstrate somewhat later on, and it makes perfect sense. These people worked with the 360-degree radian, and to get it, 360 has to be divided by double pi, not pi. Double pi, then, was another of the curious constants in the matrix. So let's see how it reacts to some of the others, like maybe the square root of 2160. It's another of their strange constants, and important, too. They even marked this one out for us over at Giza. It's the actual east longitude of tiny pyramids number 4, 5, and 6 at the base of the Great Pyramid. Zero, zero degrees, zero, zero minutes, zero, seven point three nine six eight seconds. I call these pyramids tiny only because they set by a true giant. Before they were ruined, they stood as high as the tallest pyramids in the Western Hemisphere. Giza's pyramids take the honors where height is concerned, but that's all. Several western pyramids are considerably larger in their base proportions, and many of our effigy earthworks could cover the Giza site in its entirety, places like Panther Mound and Poverty Point. In addition, this new constant of 7.3968 is a squared number. Its square root will be quickly recognized by British antiquarians as a direct hit, with a 2.719-foot megalithic yard as refined by Alexander Fahm, though it is better known as 2.72 feet. Could it be that the megalithic yard is only a square root? Whatever the case, this squared number 7.396 was widely applied to this ancient matrix system, Indeed, it even speaks to Stonehenge. When archaeologists A.T.C. Atkinson and Gerald Hawkins examined Stonehenge, they determined its original diameter to have been 97 feet 4 inches, hence a radius of 48 feet 8 inches, or 48.66 feet in the decimal mode. Could the 48.6693 seen as the result of this equation represent its original radius in modern 
British feet? One of the exquisite aspects of this ancient matrix is its built-in set of checks and balances. For example, when we take the grid longitude of Stonehenge and divide it by all the numbers it shows us, 2, 15, 60, square root 15, and square root 60, we are left with this. The decimal place is off, but the numbers are exactly twice those of 48.6693 seen in the previous formula. Is it valid? Are these the actual numbers, the original numbers, in the diameter of Stonehenge? They vary from those found by Atkinson and Hawkins by about 332nd of an inch, hardly enough of a variance to notice in actual field measurements. In fact, they are just that. And this figure will be found extensively in the matrix, very extensively. It was heavily favored in Western monuments. Now having it once again, it is a simple matter to log all of the vital measurements at Stonehenge. Finally, the square of the megalithic yard shows us this, when given to double pi. It's another of their weird constants, and one of considerable import. I have come to call it their alternate pi, AP. Here's how it works. Give it to the standard generic 360 degree circle, and find the actual circumference of Stonehenge in feet. It works just as well off the 360 degree radian to find, once again, the radius of Stonehenge. It's why I call it their alternate pi. It's the constant they employed to explain the relationship of their 12-inch metrological unit to their radian-based matrix. I even prefer it to the pi ratio we use, 11772457771. 11772457771. It's poetic. Say it twice and it's memorized. It sure beats trying to memorize pi out to eight or nine decimal places. We now have ten of their constants, having added to the original list the square of the megalithic yard, the radius of Stonehenge, and alternate pi. Is this all of them? No, but it is enough to take us some distance into the decoding process. And we found most of them right here at Stonehenge. The outer stone circle of phase three conveys its latitude, while the inner display, in conjunction with its 288-foot-wide phase one earth circle, convey its West Giza longitude. Now we know why phase one was necessary. Then Stonehenge goes on to explain several mathematical constants in use at the time of its construction. The decoding is what tripped us up. Who would have thought? that it was entirely restricted to maps and mathematics. Stonehenge, a magnificent calculator rendered in rock. Batteries not included or required. The access key is curiosity.
the pyramids at Giza, enigmas, mystical shapes, royal tombs, even the work of the devil, depending upon the degree of intellect at work trying to explain them. There are enough books in print about these monuments, most particularly the Great Pyramid, to fill a small library, almost all of which attempt to explain their purpose. Mostly they assert personal beliefs. Those that sound good to other thinkers are echoed, and echoed, until they work their ways into the realm of accepted fact. Typical is the continuing assertion that they, along with all the other pyramids of Egypt, about 83 to date, were tombs for the ruling class. For many, the bait has been taken. They are tombs. Despite the fact that we have yet to find the remains of any pharaohs in any of them. Well, if Egypt's pharaohs built these pyramids, they were a whole lot better advised in mathematics, geodetics, and astronomy than the written record is able to support. In the absence of written records, we depend on archaeology for answers at Giza. But archaeology lives to dig, to find the tangible hand-held artifacts of early people. Unfortunately, digging will never answer the reason for pyramids. The pyramids are mathematical law. They represent intelligence, and intelligence isn't buried. It's left for all to see, above ground and in clear sight. Sometimes they even left stuff laying around that was so obvious we can't see it. For example, matrix vector GV, my code for Giza vector. The two sets of smaller pyramids, 4, 5, and 6, and 7, 8, 9, were aligned to point right at it, an intersection of azimuths. But the builders left nothing, no pyramid, no stakes, nothing, at vector GV. Now why'd they do that? To make the obvious unobvious, obviously. And of the hundred odd books I have digested on the Giza Pyramid site, not one discusses this silent, unmarked point. Indeed, they fail to even speculate on why the small pyramids were laid out in straight lines. It went right by everyone. We already have the grid figures for these two azimuths, 41,252.96 comes from Mexico's Juliaco, the surface area of a 360-degree sphere, and the square of the megalithic yard, 7.39685. Dividing the two figures, we are left with GV's value, 5,577.096018. It will serve to demonstrate that we can get something from nothing, GV, if we know the language. Since Stonehenge explained the language, there's nothing holding us back, so let's go for it. Three pyramids present each of these invisible lines to vector GV. That's three pi in the language. Apply it and find the grid longitude of Stonehenge. 52,562.89. There are two sets of pyramids involved. That's 2 pi, which finds us the square root of the volume of the 360 degree sphere exactly. Or we can drop pi and divide by the double radian to retrieve the exact radius of Stonehenge in feet. We also have the option of applying the square root of 15 from Stonehenge, from which prints out the grid latitude of same. In all, six small pyramids point to GV. That's 6 pi. Testing, we find the grid longitude of the Tsinsunsan pyramid in Mexico, the 3,100-foot-long Tsinsunsan the world's longest pyramid.
The tallest pyramid in the world is the Great Pyramid. Good longitude, 360 degrees. Apply it to vector GV, and we retrieve 15.4919. There's a new number for the pot. And coming off the Great Pyramid, it must have been important. It was. Thirteen square miles of importance. They laid an entire city out on this azimuth. Teotihuacan in Mexico. Math can be used either extensively or expansively. We have seen how 3 pi responds to vector gv. Now let's turn it around and raise pi to its third power, the cube of pi. Applying it, we find the grid latitude of Monk's Mound at Cahokia, Illinois, North America's largest pyramid. Not bad for a silent guide. See, they didn't have to mark vector GV, just align something toward it. Too bad it took us so long to wonder about it. Okay, now that we have figured out the fine art of finding solid substance from nothing, let's try something we can see and kick, like perhaps the Great Pyramid. I can't imagine anyone over the age of 16 who has never heard of the Great Pyramid. It is the best known of them all. Unfortunately, when the Arabs removed all its facing stones, the measurements went with it. And try as we have, no one has been able to retrieve them. Why? Because those who try don't know the language. Would you like to know what they were? Its measurements are not lost. They never were. While men might destroy a monument dedicated to math, the math itself is eternal. Like any consciousness, matter is perishable, math is not. Remember Stonehenge? Its stones gave us its original measurements. Even though it is two-thirds destroyed, its measurements and message survive intact. The same is true of the Great Pyramid. Its most important measurement was its height, and retrieving it is quite simple. We already know one of the numbers required for the formula, the Great Pyramid's 360-degree meridian, the prime meridian of remote antiquity. Now, marking a prime meridian as it did, the Great Pyramid has an attribute which is uniquely its own. Its prime meridian runs across it from pole to pole. As everyone knows, the poles represent 90 degrees north or south. We have our second number. The other numbers we already know. The most important of all numbers in the matrix is the 57.295 degree radian. The next most important is alternate pi, which converts their radian-based system to metrological units of measure, as Stonehenge explained. Simply divide 90 by the radian and alternate pi, and then multiply the result by 360, and voila, the original height of the monument. 480.3471728 feet. And remember, that's feet, not meters, cubits, reeds, or stadiums, but feet. Too easy? Too quick? You were expecting maybe a formula that runs out in the next week? Granted, there are those among us who would prefer that this equation actually be complexity to the 90th power in order that they alone might understand it. But the pyramids were left for all to see, for all to understand, not just a select few. And in order for that plan to bear fruit, 
simplicity was essential in the delivery on behalf of the builders. Sure, I found their alternate pie, and it wasn't easy. That alone took a dozen years and some 30,000 mathematical probes, but we can also verify these proportions without using their alternate pi, or even pi for that matter. All we actually need is the 360 degree longitude of the Great Pyramid and the radian. Remember, their entire matrix was built around these two numbers. Take the generic 57.2957 radian, and divide it by 360 degrees. Then multiply the result by the Great Pyramid's circumference to find its actual height of 480.347 feet. It's so simple it's almost embarrassing. John Taylor could not argue his theory for the Great Pyramid for lack of measurements. And even if he had them available, he probably would not have known what they meant. Nobody was thinking in terms of a radian-based matrix at that time. The time was not right. But now it is. And again, we have the proportions of the Great Pyramid. Here they are, for the first time in 10 or 12,000 years. Its original specs. What do they offer? That depends what we wish to look for in the prehistoric record. It holds a wealth of data in trust for us. For example, the length of the year at that time. Its volume divided by its vector in the matrix, the cube of double pi, I'll get to that shortly, divided by its height, divided by its length, Multiply the result by 360, its prime meridian. 365.020081. Is that the length of the year? If so, it isn't the year we know. To us, the solar year is 365.2422 days long. So why the disparity? The solar year, we know, is not a constant. The only constants in physics are matter and energy. How they behave is now, always has been, and ever shall be, subject to variations which affect matter and energy. This 365.2422 day year we like to hold as a constant in our perceptions is increasing in length. Ever hear of the leap second? It's a second of time that we add to our timekeeping from time to time in order to keep accurate track of time. Since 1972, we've added 18 of them. How long has this been going on? 1,500 years ago, the Mayans recorded the length of the year at exactly 365.2420 days. And the further back we study the oldest of calendars, the more they tend to focus on the whole number 365, as if they were trying to follow an earlier mandate of 365.02 that was known much earlier. Frankly, I don't think that the length of the solar year has ever been a constant, but there may once have been an ideal. This may be what we're looking at here. One of the reasons I say this is because this particular figure, which I call the solar year ideal, makes a good showing of itself in the matrix, locking itself on certain constants such as this one. And this one. And we will see it again as we move along. Besides, these measurements at the Great Pyramid are very precise, very securely locked into place, almost like a genetic code 
it has to follow preset patterns, such as this one at Stonehenge. We take the smaller figure of its 48.6693 foot radius and divide it by its larger 305.798 foot circumference. Then multiply the result by 360 to find the radian. The Great Pyramid uses precisely the same coding. Take the smaller figure for the Great Pyramid's height and divide it by its larger base perimeter. Then multiply by 360 to find the radian again. A beautiful lock. One of the great thrills in the decoding of this prehistoric pyramid matrix are the new discoveries which pop out on occasion. This is one of them. 0 0.15915493, the reciprocal of double pi. It's missing from our math books, but was obviously held in very high regard in antiquity, a mathematical constant in its own right, a ratio which exists between these multiples of double pi. The measurements at Stonehenge, those at the Great Pyramid, and the Base 360 system, and the Radian. A few years ago, Richard Hoagland told me that he thought the Matrix was exquisite. It's all of that, Dick. The descriptive eye sense isn't yet in our vernacular. God, what IQs these people must have enjoyed. But it only follows. Genesis tells us that they lived lifetimes of several hundred years. They had the time to learn, the time to understand the importance of knowledge, and the time to hone wisdom. They knew routines we haven't even thought about. And their genius wasn't restricted just to Stonehenge and the Great Pyramid. It reached even into the Western Hemisphere. Zero point one five nine one five four nine is less than zero, an inverted quantity. The unknown Teotihuacanos of Mexico honored this inverted constant by dedicating a pyramid to it. An inverted pyramid dug down below ground level. Here you are standing right in the middle of it at matrix vector 9.1189065. The Quetzalcoatl complex is big. If you'd like to take a hike around it, be sure to bring a lunch. It has a perimeter of a mile. The largest inverted prehistoric monument ever found. 0 0.1591549 by the radian, 9.1189065, that's inverted, of course. On the plus side, multiply it by double pi and get the radian again. Quetzalcoatl's inverted center is 765 feet wide. They could have built the Great Pyramid within its depression. But what about Stonehenge, where this new constant was taught? Try it against the 48.669-foot radius of Stonehenge and find the square root of 60. Now we know why they encoded the square roots here. When the Arabs defaced the Great Pyramid, they forgot one of the stones. When we found it, it was promptly shipped off to England. 
where its sloped surface was subjected to some of the finest instruments we have. Its slope angle was found to be 51 degrees, 51 minutes, 14.305 seconds. The findings were distributed around the world in the hope that someone, anyone, could find a reason for this curious angle. To date, no one has any answers, except their own. It's the price we pay for believing that the builders were ignorant. 51 degrees, 51 minutes, and 14.305 seconds can also be expressed as 51.8539736 degrees. In this, its decimal mode, it has a tangent. And this tangent is a mathematical ratio. That which separates the cube of pi from the square of double pi. Watch out for their tangents. They made dandy hiding places for information. Anyway, that gives us another pi aspect in the Great Pyramid. Now let's climb up to its apex. Which is no longer intact. Today the destroyers got that too. And of course we have yet to find its capstone which, really, we don't need. Now having its original proportions, we can make it ourselves. It requires only that we be careful to give it the same slope angle as found in the base facing stone, the reciprocal of which, when calculated from the perpendicular, is exactly 38.1460263 degrees. the tangent of which is 0 0.78539817.5, which, when then multiplied by the four sides of this pyramid, well, is there anyone who doesn't know what that is? And right off the very top of the monument. Okay, let's see what we have so far. Pi off its apex. Double pi is the ratio between its height and base perimeter. A three-dimensional model of double pi, which was built on a squared base. That's double pi squared. The tangent of its slope angle hides the ratio between the cube of pi and the square of double pi. And, of course, the reciprocal of double pi. We missed anything? This pyramid is pi from the ground up. Okay, we have its makeup and its longitude. Next comes its latitude. A pyramid which marks the location of a prime meridian running north and south from pole to pole should likewise address latitude, should it not? It is logical. And all latitude is reckoned from the equator, which as it circumscribes the earth as a length, the equatorial circumference of the earth, 24,901.54558 statute miles. Twenty-four thousand nine hundred one point five four five five eight has a tangent to 1.84527019. Again, only the mathematician can recognize it for what it is, the cube root of double pi. Double pi. Does the tangent of the Earth's equatorial circumference have something to do with the double pi Great Pyramid? We have only to ask. Visualize the Great Pyramid in your mind. Four sides four base corners, and an apex, nine features. Raise this tangent, this cube root, to its ninth power, and we find the cube of double pi. Of course, all that does is prove the cube of double pi. If it has anything to offer to the matrix, we must test it against something that is in the matrix, like the Great Pyramid, since we did employ its nine features. 
The Great Pyramid's longitude was 360 degrees. What might 360 have to say to the cube of double pi? It yields this figure, which encodes a parallel of latitude, which runs right across the north face of the Great Pyramid. At this point on the pyramid, then, the matrix holds a vector at the cube of double pi. Why doesn't this parallel cross the actual apex? It wasn't supposed to. That point was reserved for something else, a link with astronomy. Are we ready to admit that they knew astronomy? I am, and the most elementary constant in astronomy, or even in its predecessor, astrology, is the 25,920-year procession of the equinoxes. The equation appears long, but is actually quite simple. Divide the procession of the equinoxes by the Earth's equatorial circumference. Then divide that figure into the grid latitude on the north face of the Great Pyramid. This yields the figure which encodes the actual apex latitude of the Great Pyramid. 29 degrees, 58 minutes, 51.00 seconds north, dead center on the apex. Linked between astronomy and terrestrial geodetics. The apex latitude of the Great Pyramid is special, having little to do with the global pyramid matrix. The matrix vector in the north face was reserved for those probes. That's the Great Pyramid, pie and stone, and far more than John Taylor ever imagined. And more, perhaps, than we're ready for. But it's here, the pyramids are ours once again. What are we supposed to do with them? Learn. They are teachers, and their language is mathematics. And we are their students once again. It has been a long vacation, but the curriculum is still very much intact. No college registration necessary, no books required. Bring only maps, mathematics, curiosity, and a willingness to learn. The longitude of the Sphinx is ten times alternate pi. The Kefren Pyramid's longitude is its echo to the west of the Great Pyramid, also ten times alternate pi. The Sphinx, monument to mystery, until now, reputed to have been built by Pharaoh Kefren some 2,400 years before Christ, it has recently been proven to be much older, existing long before any of the pharaohs. It was difficult working with the Sphinx. The experts have all their sight maps screwed up. They show it facing in different directions, some due east, some just north of east, and still others just south of east. If you have such maps, pay no attention to them. Get an overhead aerial photograph. Only they show it like it is. The Sphinx faces just south of east, on an azimuth of 94.247 degrees. 30 pi. How do I know this? Because I ask its mother. You see, the Sphinx is only a kitten. Its mother is over in Florida. 
Mama Cat is so big, 5,500 feet long, that we could park a dozen of Giza's sphinxes upon it. One of them could even fit on its tail. This effigy mound, located in the Everglades, is so large that the U.S. Geological Survey named one of their maps after it, Panther Mound. The panther's vector in the matrix is exactly 30 pi, dead center. Now, why is the Sphinx exactly where it is? What constants will explain it to us? We already have its longitude, 11.77245771, that's 1. We also have its azimuth of 30 pi, that's 2. And, of course, the ever-present radian of 57.2957 degrees. Mix them up and voila, 63,571.271 which encodes its exact latitude north of the equator. That now being resolved, our next question has been around for a long time. Why is it by entity in form? Why the head of a human and body of a cat? My own conclusions on that are simple enough. The human head indicates intelligence, the cat indicates curiosity. Put the two together and we can figure out the matrix. Curiosity asks a question here, does it not? Both the head and the cat face an azimuth of 30 pi. The cat has already explained that its azimuth answers the grid vector of another cat, Florida's panther mound. If that's the logic pussyfooting around the cats, then does it not follow that the head, the human head on the sphinx, likewise answer the position of another human head in the matrix? Where do we have other human heads? There's this one, carved in rock, found at Marcoasi in Peru, the photo of which was kindly shared by Bill Cody of BC Video. There's New Hampshire's old man of the mountain. Oh yes, it too is in the matrix, even if it is only a silhouette, which is best seen from the north. Think about that for a minute, and you can figure it out. And forget the argument that it's a natural sculpture. In fact, I hope it is because if it is, then it has been around longer than the pyramids, in which case, its position was worked into the matrix long before the first pyramids were built. But my own personal favorite is the Great Face at the Poverty Point Complex in northeastern Louisiana. Poverty Point is big. The concentric circle of earthen ridges shown here has a measured diameter of 3,950 feet, one foot for every mile of the Earth's polar radius. Archaeologists call it an ancient trading center, despite the fact that they find little there in the way of artifacts. Some even insist that it was an ancient city. Sorry about that, but it's pure matrix. See the 700-foot-long bird mound? shaped on its western flank. Its latitude is 32 degrees 38 minutes 06.119 seconds north. Multiplied, these three numbers become 7441.5064. The area of Stonehenge at Poverty Point. Poverty point is pure matrix. There's another large mound about a mile to the north. Archaeologists call it a tailless, unfinished bird mound that was intended to look like the one to the south. Not so at all. Anyway, where's the face I was talking about? The matrix consists of much more than just pyramids, earthworks, and mathematics. Shapes are important, too, and to see them, the investigator must be able to work with topographical maps. Therein lie the clues which blow right past the average archaeologist. On the east side of the Poverty Point complex, the land drops sharply toward the Macon Bayou, and a topographical map shows it quite clearly.
the outline of a human face, a mile-long human face. The unfinished bird mound, called the motley mound, takes on a very clear meaning now, doesn't it? It is an eye. Its grid latitude is 32,400, 32 degrees, 39 minutes, 25.96 seconds north. And its dead center vector in the matrix is 1.909859, one thirtieth of the radian. Okay, now let's test the eye's vector against the vector on the human-headed sphinx at Giza, 5400, and see what the two faces talk about. They talk about math, vector to vector, face to face, the exact area of the 360 degree circle. Cat to cat, human head to human head, both talk to the matrix in the well ordered language of geomathematics. Now, why did they build the Sphinx at a grid vector of exactly 5400? Not that I mind, to be sure. Rational numbers are always welcome, and they do occasionally present themselves in the matrix, as Stonehenge and Newark explained back in the first segment. The Sphinx has the ability to address the matrix by way of common rational numbers and the irrational constants. Over at Juliaco in Mexico, we discovered that when we apply the pi ratio to its four terraces, making it four pi, it began to explain things. But there are no terraces to count on the Sphinx. It does, however, show us all four of its paws. Notice what happens when we multiply its 5400 vector by four pi. It furnishes the figure which encodes the grid latitude of Giza's Kefrin Pyramid, the one which shares the same longitude as the Sphinx. It even answers the 48.669 foot radius of Stonehenge, another of their special matrix constants. Multiplied by the 5400 vector of the Sphinx, we get this, which encodes the West Giza longitude of the tallest pyramid ever built by the Mayans, Temple 4. The Temple of the Double-Headed Serpent at Tikal in Guatemala, 228 feet high. And do notice the final element in its actual longitude. Perfect match to the radius of Stonehenge. Not bad for primitives. Temple 4. Then we have the rational numbers. Multiply the Sphinx's vector by 2, and we get 10,800. The grid latitude at the center of Mississippi's 670-foot-long Emerald Mound. Multiplied by 4, 21,600. The grid latitude of Stonehenge. By 5, 27,000. The grid latitude of Germany's Golo Circle. By 6, 32,400. Grid latitude of the eye on the face at Poverty Point. And by 24, 129,000. Exactly. Or the square of 360. The grid longitude of North Bimini's 500 foot long shark mound.
See? That wasn't so difficult. It's just a matter of knowing the language, consulting maps, and following directions. Their directions. Something else to think about here. As the Sphinx is now known to date back at least to 7,000 years before Christ, and probably a lot further, what about Flora's panther mound, whose vector in the matrix, 30 pi, is an exact match to the azimuth of the Sphinx? And its four paws show us the grid latitude of the Kefren pyramid. To me, that says it loudly. Same age. In which case, even Kefren's pyramid isn't Kefren's. But it wouldn't be fair to assert something like that. What I will assert, since I can prove it, is that the Matrix plan is at least as ancient as the Sphinx. On that, there is no further question, because the only way this finding can be effectively challenged is to remove such things as the Kefren Pyramid, Panther Mound, Emerald, Poverty Point, Golo, and the others from the face of the earth, in order that they no longer address our maps, and, of course, the mathematical guidance they provide. And even if we somehow manage to obliterate all of these monuments, don't laugh, we've wrecked hundreds of them already, and burned all of our maps, the matrix would survive anyway, because there are some things in it we cannot get our hands on just yet. Let's go back to the Great Pyramid for a few moments. I want to show you something. Here we are running the Great Pyramid's data once again. The first half of the equation is identical to the one I demonstrated when the figure 365.020081 popped out. In that one, the final part of the expression required the use of the number 360. This time I'll drop the 360 and replace it with these two multiples of double pi, which the Great Pyramid has already explained to us. This time it shows 9929.184896. What is it? Well, it isn't the solar year this time. It encodes the grid latitude of another large formation. A gigantic five-sided monster at 40 degrees 52 minutes 04.773 seconds north latitude. Why is this one safe from any potential destruction? Because it's not here. It's over on Mars. At a place called Cydonia. At grid latitude 9929.184896. Now, what's this Martian formation doing locked in on, on our terrestrial matrix system, as if the planners at Giza knew about it? No, this is no joke. When the Viking photos were found showing this region of Mars, Richard Hoagland, with the help of Errol Turin of the U.S. Defense Mapping Agency, laid out a precise grid for the site. And this is where this 1.6-mile-long monster pyramid called the DNM Pyramid, just happens to center itself. Richard and Errol were already convinced that the DNM was an intelligently rendered formation several years before I ever saw their Sidonia grid, and long before they ever knew about my research. But if the DNM was intelligently rendered, who did it? There's nobody home over on Mars today, at least that's what we're told. The first question that crossed my mind when I saw the hoagland turin grid was if it was intelligently made, and being two-thirds of a mile high as it is, might it have once marked a prime meridian on Mars, like our Great Pyramid did over here? DNM's latitude rolls right off the Martian equator, but its longitude failed the matrix. But then its prime meridian is arbitrary, based on nothing in particular, like our own Greenwich. So I decided to move it over and center it on the DNM, just out of curiosity. With the DNM now being at longitude 360 degrees, its vector would be 27.58106. 
Hold that thought. About 10 miles north-northeast of the DNM is the so-called FACE, which has won so much attention around the world. Tricks of light and shadow, the scientists tell us. But Richard Hoagland's argument for Cydonia comes from Errol Turin's computations of the angles on the DNM pyramid, where he sees the tetrahedron in evidence. The tetrahedron is a three-cornered pyramid, and in Richard's presentation on Cydonia, he explains the importance of the tetrahedron in spherical physics, that being that for some unknown reason, if we place a tetrahedron inside a sphere, its corners, at its base, will always strike the outer surface of the sphere at about 19.5 degrees north or south of the equator. And that it is at these latitudes where energies appear to manifest themselves on all planets in our solar system, the so-called storms on Jupiter, follow a latitude of 19.5 degrees. The volcanoes that have been cooking off in Hawaii for the past dozen years are also at 19.5 degrees north of the equator. The five-mile-high Olympus Mons, an inactive volcano on Mars, locates at 19.5 degrees. It's all quite real. Natural energies appear to focus themselves at this latitude on the spinning bodies of the solar system. Well, I'm not an astronomer or physicist, but I am familiar with a tetrahedron. Each side of the tetrahedron contains three 60-degree corners. In all four surfaces, we have a grand total of 720 degrees. In the language of the matrix, the tetrahedron is 720. Well, activity on the surface of planets seems to indicate that nature knows about the tetrahedron. I'll give her that. But does she know about other mathematical constants, like maybe double pi, the 3D form of Giza's Great Pyramid? 720 and double pi. The result divides down through 41 degrees and 11 minutes to wind up at 10.0308 seconds. And guess what's there? The face. Okay, back to the drawing board. If nature shaped this humanoid face on Mars, from double pi in the tetrahedron, then she must have built our Great Pyramid as well. She's a builder as well as a thinker. Man, that'll do a job on prevailing thought. Okay, let's see how sharp she really is. The matrix employs a lot of constants that we're not used to seeing. Let's try a tough one on her, like the square root of 2160. The grid latitude of Sidonia's face, square root of 2160. How about that? The face knows the diameter of Stonehenge. Can Sidonia's face see all the way to Stonehenge? This is most embarrassing. Well, if it can see Stonehenge from Mars, maybe it can also see the global matrix itself. Let's check it out. Let's run the pi fractionals by it. Vector one-third pi, represented by Monk's Mound at Cahokia. Vector two-thirds pi, represented by North Bimini Shark Mound. And finally, pi itself, represented by the Great Pyramid. There is much chance it could see all of them at the same time. Could this low number stump it? Not if the Martian Prime Meridian centers itself on the DNM Pyramid, because the face centers itself exactly 00, zero degrees and 06.89 minutes to the east of it. Checkmate. The face got us again. But you know, nature is even smarter than that. She also positioned Sidonia's face 
at this longitude for another reason. Recall how the tangent of the Earth's equatorial circumference can be raised to the ninth power to show us the grid vector of the Great Pyramid? Watch what happens when we raise the face's longitude to the ninth power. I have three almanacs here in my study, and all three show the distance from the Earth over to Mars as 35 million statute miles. We do like to round off large numbers, but this figure is so close it's laughable. Nature, as we see here, also knows mileage in terms of statute miles, which isn't so surprising when we recall that she also knew the diameter of Stonehenge a few equations back. The grid vector on the face is 656.5612703. When we divide its grid latitude by its longitude, what an interesting arrangement of numbers, 6565. Five. Let's put this one through the matrix mill too. If we can't find a misfire somewhere, we may have to live with this alien intrusion into our matrix. We need the astronomical test, Po, the precession of the equinoxes, 25,920 years, the most elementary of all astronomical constants. And since Mars is out there in space, and again, Sidonia's face answers with a constant right off the Great Pyramid at Giza, the square of double pi. We can't seem to trip her up. Maybe if we tried a different approach. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Moon, and Mars. Mars is the fifth body out from the Sun. That's five pi in the language of the matrix. More egg in the face. There's that number from Juliaco again. The area of the 360 degree circle. The face can't be tripped. Mother Nature, the artist, couldn't have picked a more sobering spot for this face. And quite safe, too. There isn't much chance of our trucking it off for road fill. And starting tomorrow morning, I will get up early, go outside, and bow to the east, because nature is smarter than any of us. Really, now, how far can we push coincidence? It has to have limits, and Sidonia's face has outstripped them repeatedly. One more test is in order. Let's see how the Martian face speaks to one of our terrestrial faces. Remembering that the human face on the Sphinx faces an azimuth of 30 pi, and when we divide its 5400 vector by 30 pi, we found the exact value of the radian. Let's see if Sidonia's mile-long face can talk to our mile-long face at Poverty Point. Sidonia's face has an azimuth, too. It looks straight up at 90 degrees. Poverty Point's face also looks 90 degrees east. Take the Sidonian face's vector of 656.56 and divide it by 90 degrees. Call the result x. Then take Poverty Point's i, grid vector of 1 30th of the radian, and divide it by 90. Call that result y. Then divide x by y to find the exact value of 6 radian. The radian, the basic language of the matrix. What's the bottom line for Sidonia? A master formula based on the basic astronomical constant. CYFB here is the vector of Sidonia's face. DMV is the vector of the huge DNM pyramid. 
GPV is the grid vector of our own Great Pyramid, the cube of double pi. Whether we can live with the idea of intelligently rendered monuments on Mars is not the issue here. They are where they are, and they're talking to our terrestrial matrix, whether we like it or not. So call them whatever you like. The sweet thing about them is we can't get at them. Transportation is too expensive. And by the way, if we should someday decide to destroy our Greek pyramid in some stupid nuclear war, fret not. The mandate for its 480.347 foot height is safely stored away on Mars, 35 million miles away. All we have to do is put a 360 degree prime meridian on its DNM pyramid, like someone did on our Great Pyramid, and the work order remains intact. Because the law is universal. For the overly skeptical, the easiest way to dispose of what we have seen here in the past few minutes is to simply remove my prime meridian from the DNN pyramid. And it will all simply go away, withdrawing into oblivion once again, and leave us alone. Except for the curious, who, having done their homework, will realize that it happened once before in human history. You see, the ancients knew the vector numbers for Sidonia's face. Six, five, six. They left them everywhere. Like in the outside diameter of Germany's Golo Circle, 656 feet. And over at Tikal in Guatemala, they're everywhere. Here on Temple One, the so-called Temple of the Giant Jaguar, notice the platform upon which the lofty temple rests. Maller measured it over a century ago, 6.56 feet high. The Temple of the Giant Jaguar is poorly named, by the way. It was the Peripheral Pyramid, as I will explain in my next video. The same is true of Temple Two, the Temple of the Masks. Temple platform is 6.56 feet high. And on Temple 3, Temple of the Jaguar Priest. And on Temple 4, the Temple of the Double-Headed Serpent. 6.56 feet. Maller apparently did not measure it on Temple 5 though he did find the numbers when he measured the width of the staircase at ground level, 65.6 feet. This number is not without a certain significance to us today. 6.565 is the airy standard for computing the density of the earth. Judging from that, I'd say the Bible was right. There is nothing new under the sun. It's easy for us to believe that the Egyptians built their pyramids, that the Celts raised Stonehenge, and that the Maya and Toltecs built their monuments in Central America, all independent of each other. But these beliefs pale into insignificance when we suddenly discover that Tikal, Stonehenge, Tsin Sunsan, Teotihuacan, the face on Mars, and the Great Pyramid at Giza were known around the entire ancient world. It is the helm of this ancient order which must be identified, a body of genius which prized knowledge above all else, and whose determination it was to ensure its survival through a dark period in human history, by way of a pyramid matrix system which still defies time itself, a communication clear and direct which we moderns lack the courage to even think about. Dogma maintains that we humans got our jump start in the Middle East. I'm afraid it's all a lot of nonsense, because they who built the Matrix were smarter than the Phoenicians, Egyptians, Hebrews, Babylonians, or even the Greeks ever were. 
and it causes me to wonder just where we did come from, and maybe even where we've been. Thank you.